Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello, and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project podcast. My name is Kale Kleist, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups and the Regulatory Transparency Project here at the Federalist Society. Today, we're delighted to host Dr. Joel Zinberg for a discussion on the FDA's claims of authority to regulate laboratory-developed tests. Dr. Zinberg, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. For our audience, uh, Dr. Zinberg, MD, JD, is a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute and the director of the Paragon Health Institute's Public Health and American Wellbeing Initiative. He's a native New Yorker who recently completed two years as general counsel and senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in the economic, sorry, the executive office of the president. Further, he practiced general and oncologic surgery in New York for nearly 30 years at Mount Sinai Hospital and Icon School of Medicine, where he is an associate clinical professor of surgery. Dr. Zinberg also taught for 10 years at Columbia University Law School, where he was lecturer in law. He served for many years on New York State Board of Professional Medical Conduct and on Mount Sinai's Ethics Committee and Institutional Review Board. He's a past president and trustee of the New York County Medical Society. Dr. Zinberg has also written for publications as varied as the Journal of American Medical Association, Bulletin of American College of Surgeons, the Wall Street Journal, City Journal, and Law Reviews. Now, there's certainly more to say, uh, but in the interest of getting to our discussion, I will leave it there. Although, if you'd like to know more, you can access Dr. Zinberg's impressive full bio at regproject.org. With that, however, uh, let's get to the discussion. Uh, Dr. Zinberg, starting at the beginning, what are laboratory-developed tests and who uses them? So, laboratory-developed tests, or as they're known by their shorthand, LDTs, are tests that are designed and manufactured and used within a single laboratory. Uh, And it's generally a laboratory that's certified to perform high-complexity testing under CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments of 1988. Uh, So these have usually been tests that are created by highly respected academic and public health laboratories in response to an unmet clinical need or where there's an existing diagnostic tests are inadequate. So, for example, uh, LDTs were developed for emerging infectious diseases such as HIV, SARS, H1N1 influenza, long before FDA approved tests were available. Other times, tests have been created for rare genetic conditions that have been seen in the laboratory's patient population or cancer biomarkers or to track drug levels when they're of use to clinicians who work in those laboratories. Uh, and, And while the FDA has long claimed authority to regulate LDTs, it's almost never done so. LDTs have instead been regulated by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, under CLIA. Got it. And so given that there's been this long claim to power, but it hasn't always been used, why are we talking about this now? Well, look, we're we're talking about it now because the FDA, for the first time in its history, uh, has advanced a rule through notice and comment rulemaking, asserting its authority to regulate LDTs. Uh, And there's no question that the the Food and uh, Drug Cut and Cosmetics Act uh, gives the FDA broad authority to regulate medical devices. uh, And that's defined as things that are intended for use in the diagnosis of disease. Uh, And in particular, Uh, The 1976 medical device amendments under the act uh, give the the, uh, agency uh, the ability to conduct pre-market review of diagnostic tests. Um, But, uh, you know, while those amendments give the authority to regulate diagnostic tests that are manufactured by one entity and sold to other laboratories, it's less clear that the statute gives the authority to regulate LDTs, which, as I mentioned earlier, are manufactured and used within a single laboratory. So the FDA has claimed they have this authority to regulate LDTs for at least 30 years, but it's never enforced it. Uh, it always cites enforcement discretion, uh, saying uh, that LDTs do not need to comply with normal FDA regulations that require devices to undergo pre-market review and to receive approval or clearance or authorization from the agency. So now the FDA 
for the first time as now saying it's, it's going to go ahead and exercise that authority through rulemaking. And it's worth noting that in the past, the FDA has on multiple occasions asserted that it would have guidance uh, outlining this authority, uh, but it's actually never finalized that guidance. So this is the first time uh, that the FDA is actually resorting to rulemaking to to do this. Uh, And this proposed rule that they issued in October of 2023 explicitly states that in vitro diagnostic products are devices under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, regardless of where they're made and used and who else regulates them, including, and this is the key uh, key language, including when the manufacturer of the IVD is a laboratory. So to me, you know, this raises multiple questions. First of all, does the FDA really have statutory authority to regulate LDTs? And is it a good idea for them to do so? I think that the FDA's proposed rulemaking likely exceeds the agency's statutory authority and will be counterproductive, decreasing the innovation and diagnostic testing that's needed in general, and that is particularly valuable in emergencies and for combating emerging infectious diseases. And the result will leave the nation less prepared for the next medical emergency. Thank you. And I'll be interested to get into the potential ramifications of this decision a little further in the podcast. Um, But for now, I'd love to ask a question about the potential impacts practically. Um, Since the FDA has long claimed this authority, but has used discretionary non-enforcement, what would this proposed rule actually change on the ground for labs, for the FDA? Um, Since these tests are already regulated under the CLIA, what would change practically? Well, it would be a tremendous change because the situation now is you have some 12,000 laboratories across the country that fall into the what's called CLIA level three labs, high complexity labs. Uh, And these are sophisticated labs. They're free to create these new tests um, for these unmet clinical needs. Uh, and they can do it, you know, with very little limitation and in, and more importantly, in response to clinical needs that clinicians are expressing to them. Uh, and they're regulated by CLIA, but they're regulated for what's called analytic accuracy. So in other words, what the CLIA is finding out, making certain is that if they say they're testing for Um, item X, that indeed it is an accurate test for item X. What they're not doing is testing for what the FDA terms is clinical accuracy, which means that item X indicates that there's a particular clinical problem that this patient might have. Um, And what we have a situation now is that you're relying on the expertise of the laboratories uh, to come up with these new methodologies and uh, uh, and testing services. And then you're relying on the expertise of the clinicians who order them and utilize the results. If you take that away and you set up a system uh, where FDA has to approve each one of these new tests or at least do some sort of pre-market review, you're going to uh, limit the amount of innovation that can take place because it's going to take a lot more time to get these things online and it's going to take a lot more money. Uh, And FDA's own estimates uh, of what this is going to cost are really substantial. Uh, so it's, it, they are predicting that you're going to have something like, um, I think with the, the figure is $35.5 billion uh, of compliance costs over the four to five year phase in of their rule. And then there'll be ongoing recurring costs of $4.2 billion a year. And they themselves acknowledge that this is going to drive a lot of these small laboratories uh, that that comprise about half of the uh, laboratory developed tests on an annual basis uh, out of business, or at least at minimum limit the amount of laboratory developed tests they offer. Um, So, you know, this is a substantial burden on these folks. Um, 
In fact, they, 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 their economists say that they, they figure the annualized cost per entity would be about 23% of their receipts, which is obviously a substantial amount of money for, particularly for a small laboratory. So they themselves acknowledge this is going to drive these folks out of business. Um, and not only will you not have these new tests that I described, Fitting within the definition of LDTs are modifications of FDA approved tests that many of these laboratories often undertake. And, and it may be something very simple where they find that if they, they alter some, uh, step within the test or, or add some new step, uh, that it works much better than what the FDA approved or it works better for their patient population. Again, these would all technically be new tests that need FDA pre-market approval uh, under this proposed rule. So th this would be a tremendous step backwards. And I think if you really want to get a flavor for what would happen, you have to look to one of the few times where the FDA didn't utilize enforcement discretion. And that happened during the COVID pandemic. Uh, so, Amazingly, during the biggest public health emergency in over 100 years, the FDA decided that instead of utilizing tests that some academic and public health laboratories had developed for COVID at the beginning, at the end of uh, January of uh, 2020 and the beginning of January, uh, February 2020, uh, they were now going to require an FDA process to approve these tests. And what happened was at the end of January, a public health emergency was declared uh, by the HHS secretary, which enabled FDA to utilize what's called emergency use authorization. Now, an emergency use authorization is when you're dealing with commercial um, entities, it's a tremendous way of expediting things because you no longer have to go through full FDA approval. So yes, for, for drugs and tests and things like that, it was, it was going to speed things along. But when you were dealing with LDTs, it actually slowed things down. Uh, and when the University of Washington wanted to use a, a COVID test that had developed, FDA told them not to. And when, you know, a trade organization approached the uh, FDA and HHS about, um, getting an exemption from this EUA requirement, they were told, no, you have to go through it. So what happened was in February of 2020, the only EUA approved for COVID test was actually for CDC's COVID test. And that was a flawed, unreliable test that was apparent very early on after a week or two. But CDC and FDA insisted for the entire month of February that that was the only test that they would approve. And as a result, we had no real COVID testing for the entire month of February as the disease spread around the country. And that was a, a disaster. Uh, and it was only when, you know, administration officials actually stepped in and said, no, you for COVID tests, you can no longer require the EUAs. And then actually later on in August of that year, told uh, FDA that they were going to limit its authority to approve LDTs in general, that we had any kind of progress. But that gives you a flavor of what would happen if we were to uh, uh, utilize this rule and, and it, that it be finally approved. Okay, and I think that segues nicely into the next section I had, which is what are the potential outcomes? Um, given that I think we have a proposed rule that hasn't been finalized, there's a, a couple routes forward. And uh, we can continue on with the, the hypothetical you were working with earlier of what happens if this uh, proposed rule comes to be. Uh, do we have a sense for what the impact of that? You've touched on this a little bit along with costs, as well as how FDA has acted in the past. Um, but do we have a sense of what approval timelines for LDTs would be, for the requirements that would be put on labs, how that would work out? What are the potential outcomes? Well, as I said, the uh, potential outcome is a marked decrease in innovation, which is would be a terrible outcome in and of itself. Uh, as to what timelines are, it's very difficult to know, but it's not at all clear that the FDA can handle the increased workload. Uh, and again, I go back to the uh, COVID experience. Um, when FDA looked at its own experience, it found that it had a big backlog of EUAs for COVID tests. 
uh, when it, you know, approximately a year after it started doing this. So it had, uh, you know, about 285 LDTs and 85 commercial LDTs, uh, uh, not LDTs, excuse me, commercial manufacturers tests uh, that it did not even get to start reviewing more than a year after it had uh, put out this requirement of, of EUAs. So clearly it's not, you know, it's not sh so certain that with their current uh, uh, resources, they'll be able to review all these things. And, and FDA has estimated it's going to cost about three and a half billion dollars just to review existing LDTs and that there are going to be significant expenditures to review new LDTs. And while the rule contemplates some user fees, they also say that it's those user fees will not cover all of the expenses. So it, it's n not sure how this is going to, you know, play out if indeed the rule is finalized, whether they'll even be able to implement it. Got it. Beyond uh, flipping to the other side then of the, the cost benefit structure, uh, you mentioned the costs that could be imposed upon labs. Do LDT manufacturers have or are they able to be equipped to have the knowledge or capability to know what's required in these kinds of applications? Uh, since they haven't been required under the CLIA, is there a whole new set of knowledge and training and reports and whatever else that they would need in order to be able to comply? Well, what, you know, what the GAO found when it looked at this and FDA itself found was that, um, it, particularly for EUAs, the laboratories themselves were completely confused and, and did not receive uh clear instruction from FDA on how to apply. So they're just not used to dealing with this. So there's going to be at minimum a learning period for these laboratories uh, to comply with FDA requirements. But, you know, uh, arguably a lot of the laboratories are just not going to bother. <laughs> they're going to, they're going to uh, uh, not deal with it. And, and unfortunately, you know, the, the bigger manufacturers are going to be the beneficiaries here. When you have these smaller, innovative laboratories dropping out of the market, all that happens is that bigger labs and the commercial labs will step into the space uh, and you're going to have decreased competition in, the, in terms of numbers of new tests or a competition for existing tests. Uh, and that will result in higher prices. Uh, and consumers and patients are the ones who are going to suffer from that. Got it. So uh, given that the, the costs and the bandwidth required uh, if this regulation passes, um, assuming it does, what are the potential outcomes? Is the regulation likely to stand? You've mentioned there's questions as to whether or not FDA was actually given this authority in the statute. Obviously, there have been conversations at the Supreme Court concerning questions of major economic impact and whether or not agencies can make claims to authorities that aren't expressly in the statute when there is significant economic impact. What are the potential outcomes there? Well, it's not at all clear that the FDA has the authority under the existing law to uh, regulate LDTs. Um, so as I said before, there's no question they have the authority to regulate things that are manufactured and commercially distributed to third parties. But it's not clear that the statute gives them the authority to regulate these particular laboratories. So, for example, the 70, 1976 medical device amendments don't mention laboratories. They don't mention lab tests and they don't mention laboratory testing services. You just don't find uh, those mentioned there. Uh, moreover, uh, it's not at all clear that LDTs are medical devices. They seem to more neatly fit into what we would call as a medical service. So, for example, the, uh, the statute defines a device as uh, an instrument, an apparatus, an implement, a machine, a contrivance, uh, a reagent. These all sound like physical articles or products. But in fact, the, these laboratory-developed tests are a much more like a methodology uh, or a process that's developed in-house that will generate results for medical practitioners. So it's more like a service that incorporates proprietary methodologies than a physical object. And even though they may use physical objects, including FDA approved devices, that doesn't turn them into devices. 
So you have a situation where the scientists and physicians within a laboratory uh, are, <laughs> excuse me, utilizing their expertise uh, to create new tests. Um, and they're kind of utilizing their uh, medical practice knowledge. And on the other hand, you have physicians who are ordering these tests and utilizing the results and they're utilizing their medical knowledge to interpret the results and decide whether uh, they're worthwhile. In other words, they're making their own assessment of a clinical validity. And that sounds much more like medical practice than it does creating a device that's uh, developed under the uh, FDCA. And in fact, the statute explicitly prohibits the regulation of, uh, of, the, medic of the practice of medicine at, at 21 U.S. Code. 396. So that's the second thing um, to do. And there, there's other, stat, other areas within the statute that also could give you pause. So for example, the, the statute's pre-market review requirements say that it applies to persons who introduce devices in interstate commerce for commercial distribution. Um, so again, you know, with with these laboratory kits that go to many uh, created that go to many labs, there's no problem there. But the FDA's own definition of commercial distribution actually excludes the uh, movement of devices or 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 uh, products within one establishment or within the same. Uh, group of, or subsidiaries of a particular of one specific company. So that sounds much more like you know, laboratory developed tests, which by definition are manufactured and utilized within a specific uh, one specific laboratory. So that again sounds like the statute doesn't apply. Plus, interestingly. Um, as I said, the statute refers to a person who introduces a device into interstate commerce. And the HHS General Counsel actually looked at the statutory language back in June of 2020. Uh, and, and he wrote that the statute excludes states from the definition of persons. And in fact, most of the uh, laboratories that create LDTs are state-run public health laboratories or university laboratories. So he specifically says states do not fulfill the definition of persons within the statute. So again, it's uh, another reason within the statute to think that it, it doesn't apply. So if you take all of these things together, the lack of specific language within the statute authorizing uh, regulation of laboratories or laboratory services, plus all these features within the statute that seem to indicate that it was not meant to apply to LDTs, you really look like you're running afoul of uh, recent Supreme Court uh, decisions dealing with, as you said, uh, 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 questions of great economic or political importance. This, the Supreme Court in the West Virginia case made it clear that they want to see clear congressional language authorizing uh, an agency to do this sort of regulation. And I think you just do not have that here. It's, it's missing and, and they probably would not survive a challenge. And it's pretty clear that there will be a ton of challenges the minute this uh, rule is, is, uh, is finalized. And, and I think, you know, it won't just be that you have this lack of specific statutory language. You, you have another situation where even though they, the FDA has uh, claimed this authority for years, they've actually never really enforced it. And in other case law, the Supreme Court has said when you look for uh, an authority from a, a statute that's been in existence for many years, but you've never enforced it, we're going to be you know, pretty skeptical of you of you doing that. And we, you had an example of that when it, with the OSHA case um, uh, dealing with mandates for uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, you know, they they said that when when you have uh, a situation where you're going to require 84 million Americans to obtain a COVID vaccine or undergo weekly testing at their expense, it's telling that 
in a half century of OSHA's existence, it never relied on this authority to regulate occupational hazards before. So they they are they're going to be very skeptical uh, about that. Um, and the very fact that Congress, number one, created in 1988 the authority to regulate LDTs under CLIA suggests that um, they thought there was a, a different that LDTs should be presented different regulatory challenges and should be regulated under a different scheme than the FDA. And it also suggests that they didn't think the 1976 medical device amendments covered LDTs. Otherwise, why uh, create a new regulatory apparatus if you thought they you had an existing one that covered it? Finally, you also have a situation where there have been proposals in Congress Start, uh, to uh, enact legislation that would specifically give FDA the authority to regulate LDTs. Uh, and in particular, there's a, a, something called the VALID Act, which stands for the Verifying Accurate Leading Edge IV, IVCT Development Act that was first proposed in 2018, has been proposed multiple additional times, uh, but it's never passed. But the point is, why propose a statute if you think the FDA already has the authority to do it? Got it. Thank you. That's all very helpful, not only to understand what the practical potential outcomes of this rule should it come um, to be applied, and also the potential reactions that may come. I'd love to pose the alternate hypothetical. I'm not sure how... Uh, probable it is. Um, but what happens uh, since the FDA obviously has proposed guidance in the past and then removed it, claiming this power, there's been sort of a back and forth about whether or not they're going to use it. Uh, what would happen if the FDA withdrew this proposed rule and did not uh, attempt to put it into effect? Well, you then you go back to, you know, the current regime, which I think actually works pretty well. <laughs> it's not a, uh, you know, you, you have a situation where labs are, are free to innovate, uh, and they do. Uh, and, you know, you have the current scheme works pretty well. And, and it's interesting when you look at the FDA rationales for why they're proposing the rule at this time. So they claim, for example, that the nature of LDTs have changed. Uh, that LDTs were originally small volume tests done in labs serving local communities. Uh, they were simple tests. They, you know, they often replicated other tests. We didn't need to look at them particularly closely. But now that the tests are much more high tech, they're much more high uh, complex. They're being utilized for uh, people, uh, not necessarily solely in the local communities, but they're being utilized by people uh, all over the nation, um, and therefore they need to be regulated. That's their sort of uh, number one claim. Uh, but I, you know, my argument is they can't credibly claim that they were prompted to to do this because the fact is they've been talking about regulating these tests since 1992 uh, and they've issued guidance on multiple occasions that they then withdrew most recently in in 2014 and you know what they view as a criticism that people in many communities can now utilize these tests i think is a great feature in other words if if a lab comes up with an innovative test that uh, no other test is available for this particular condition or um uh, to, to uh, test for a particular biomarker or cancer marker and people all over the country have access to it, that's great, <laughs> in, in, unless there's some problem with it. Now, here's the second reason FDA claims. They claim that uh, LDTs are less reliable than FDA-approved tests. But the fact of the matter is it's it's not at all – the, the evidence they cite is, is not really – consistent with that uh, point of view. So they say, for example, some EUAs from uh, labs during uh, the pandemic uh, for, for tests were, uh, were unreliable, but they don't then compare them to the tests that were created by actual commercial manufacturers. So it's completely lacking context. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, there were all kinds of problems with the EUA, EUAs during the pandemic in large part because the FDA didn't provide adequate uh, 
uh, advice and instruction to labs who wanted to apply. And also, be, you know, this, uh, there was technical issues because there weren't adequate samples of the, the virus or its genetic material. So there were both commercial manufacturers and uh, smaller labs that make LDTs were relying on these smaller uh, fragments of the genetic material, which would have which introduced some uh, um, problems with accuracy, but that was a problem for both. And they, and then the FDA talks about some small studies dealing with oncology tests that, oh, you know, they showed that these tests, uh, that LDT test for oncology markers were inaccurate. But in fact, they completely misinterpret the study and they ignore that there's a big literature out there suggesting that LDTs for oncology tests are highly accurate and and comparable or give comparable or superior results to commercial tests that the FDA has approved. So, you know, there's no suggestion that we're going back to or preserving uh, a regime that is any way harmful. Um, And and I would argue we're preserved if we the FDA withdraws this regulation, we're preserving a regime that allows for innovation to take place and allows for innovation to take place very rapidly in emergency situations, uh, which we could have had during the pandemic, but did not have because of uh, FDA's obstruction. Got it. So uh, NPRM was promulgated in October. I assume the comment period has closed. Do we have a thought on when this rule might drop? Well, the FDA suggested in its regulatory framework they were looking for approval by April uh, of this year. And uh, there's probably a very good reason they're pushing for that is because under the Congressional Review Act, uh, there's a limited amount of time uh, that Congress has to uh, uh, review and uh, reverse a rule. And I think they are looking to uh, if they can get this rule out qu- as quickly as possible to, to ensure that it would be reviewed by this Congress, not by a new Congress that would come in at, after the next election. So we expect there's going to be action by you know sometime in the next few months. Okay. Well, we'll have to watch for around April to see what happens. Um, that is all the questions I had on the topic. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to add, Dr. Zinberg? Yeah, well, I think this is an important uh, example of an agency trying to uh, fix a problem that doesn't really exist. Uh, This is you have a system that works reasonably well. It allows for innovation. It allows particularly for innovation in emergency situations where you need a flexible, rapid response. Um, by inserting new agency regulation that it's not at all clear the agency has the uh, resources to implement. You're going to destroy a system that works pretty well at the moment and substitute one that probably will uh, create impediments to innovation in general and to the important innovation that we need in emergency situations in particular. So I, I think it's really a bad rule. If, if we think there's a problem here, this is something that Congress ought to address. Uh, and it can address it by taking up the ballot act again, or it can address it by some other piece of legislation. But by relying on the FDA to impose uh Roughly speaking, its existing structure uh, on laboratory developed tests is a tremendous step backwards that we should not take. Got it. Well, we can wrap it there. Uh, Dr. Zimberg, thank you so much for taking time out of your day today. Really appreciate you joining us and sharing your expertise and insight. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 